if scarcity was not an issue, what would you do? And I remember specifically there was someone in our class. This might not necessarily be appropriate, but I don't know if you remember this. I'm sure you do. Um, the student was like, uh, I would do so much cocaine and blow my heart up. <laughs> I'd go get another heart. Yep. I do so much cocaine. I was just like, Oh my God. Like that was nightmare. literally the first day of school in your class. Yes. And there, that is still one of the greatest responses that I ever got to that question. The question was a little bit more refined, which was what would happen if there was no material scarcity? Yeah. yeah no material because, scarcity. And, and this is an important distinction because I actually do believe that we're about to enter or have the potential to enter a world where we don't have material scarcity, not to the extent that we have today, not even remotely close. The first time we grab one asteroid, it's totally done. If you've not been watching, just go look on any of the social platforms right now. There's these videos that were old stills that someone has turned into animations that show different asteroids that we visited, like Eros and some of these others. And they just superimpose them like on a city, like over Los Angeles, like everybody in Los Angeles is gone. Yeah. Like the idea that there's more metal in one of those than we've ever mined on earth. It doesn't match people's where their heads are. And so the purpose of that was, because if you remember, the semester ends with asteroid mining. Mm -hmm. And yes. the idea that, hey, there actually is a technology that's coming that could, could, doesn't have to, but could, end the material scarcity part. But what's going to happen with that, in that environment? If you remember, there were like four or five kinds of groups of answers that I would get to that, that question. So people would say, I would travel. Mm -hmm. They're really adventurous. Like, I would travel. I'd go and see everything. There are people who would just leisure. They're like, I'd ski, I'd golf, I'd do whatever. I'd do a pile of cocaine so big my heart blows. Up. Mm. <laughs> and then I'd get a new heart, which is what he said. Yeah. And I was like, he gets it. He understands what material scarcity is. Like, that's not going to fix the emotional reason that you did that, but you'll get a new heart. Yeah. And then there were people who would tinker. They're like, oh, I'd spend all my time inventing or I'd like research stuff. I'd do this. And then there was this fifth group, which I think may be the, the plurality at this point, not the majority, but the plurality. And the one that is the most concerning, which is, I don't know what the hell I would do. Yeah. I do. And remember they actually Joel. feel very, very lost. That question terrifies them. Yeah. I, I think that's a scary question or a scary response. Specifically, if you look at like what's happening with like the trucking industry, <laughs> you know, like right. automation, like with like self-driving cars and what's going to happen if overnight there's no truck drivers, mm -hmm. you know, like what, what's going to happen there and like, how are people going to respond and I think you're right. Like I, I remember being in that class and hearing some flavor of all of those questions. And that to me, I was like, I, I, I was in the category of it'd be fun to invent and just kind of have the freedom to do whatever you want. Because to me, there's a lot of people that have passions and like Marcus actually talked about this the other day. Like he's super passionate about making films and making things. There's not a lot of money in it. Right. So if like there was no money object and you could just do what you want to do all day, people would naturally, I think, tend to do what they want to do um definitely like i mean that's that's a good question to even ask like right now like what would you do ali if you could do stuff all day and not have to worry about I money mean, or resources i would and, do a combination of traveling and creating at the same time yeah just take my hobbies on the road paint, paint in italy one <laughs> yeah. day take photos in ethiopia another day just yeah. just hop around it's it's very interesting. Um, just that question alone made me think for a long time about not necessarily like what's happening right now, but what's going to happen and how I feel like we're not necessarily prepared for anything like that. Like automation is, and that was kind of like a foundation um, for that class was like, basically the more you automate people naturally kind of fall out of the economy just because there's jobs that are kind of taken up. Yeah. Um, yeah. But the thing about automation, it's different. So again, let's look at history. So there have been, times in history where entire populations have been displaced by other populations. Sometimes it's war, sometimes it's immigration, sometimes it's intentional. Like they're just shuffling people around. Like they were conquered in one area, they move them to another area. And you can actually see how that affected local crafts, artisans, production services. That's people replacing people. So those people also have the same requirements as the other people. The machines don't. The machines have typically far less requirement than the people they're replacing. So this opens up at least the potential and the interesting dynamic here, which is, and I would say this in class, maybe it's not a bad thing that we're going to hand over production to machines. Maybe it's not a bad thing that we're going to hand over the day-to-day the -day task of producing to machines. The question then becomes, what are the things that the machine can't do? So there's a lot of debate about whether AI can be creative. And I've seen some examples that blow my mind. It, it's amazing. And then others that are so laughable that it's like, yeah, this is not yeah. going to replace a person anytime soon. 
but can they do driving a truck? That's the one that everybody goes to. Mm. The one that they're going to, they've already done it and nobody's even paying attention is lawyers. Yeah. I, yeah. So just having an AI that can do discovery by searching documents, that is so much more effective than handing box, surprise, surprise. It's so much more effective to have a machine go through that than to hand boxes of papers to a human who's worked already 18 hours and say, highlight every time the word hamburger shows up. Yeah. Good luck. Your, your error is so much higher on that task than the machine. There's a guy, Ben Taylor, who was at Higher View and now he's at Data Robot, who has a great quote that I repeat often that he talked about self-driving cars, that this assumption of how far away self-driving cars were uh, just got shattered because the bar the humans were setting was so low that the machines could very easily step over it. Yeah. I think that's true in a lot of other places. If we give the ability to produce over to these machines, then there's the question of like, well, how do I afford something? But if the price of everything is zero because machines don't require very much to operate, what, yeah. we're back to a no scarcity situation. They have data on you and blah, 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 blah. But then when I actually went to go work for a security company and I saw the data they were doing at such a scale, I was just like, this is scary yeah. as shit. Like, this is so scary because yeah. what they can pull up on you now is just insane. And I mean, I'll talk about one thing specifically. Like we, this company that I worked at, we worked for a specific like uh, banking company and the application that the, it was a huge banking company. I'll say which one, but um it was a huge one where people obviously log into it daily around the world, whatever. Um, they could see granularly basically through like the API of the application, they could see people's like um, how their fingers went across the screen. And oh. like, they could see like what tilt, like the guy row the phone was at and they could see like, you know, the heat of the phone and they could see like the CPU usage at the time and they could see all this stuff. Wow. And the reason why they were doing it at the time was specifically to, um, figure out if bots were controlling it because bots don't they don't have like fat fingers right like they don't mess up yeah. on the login screen they don't like like when you have a bot type in like your password it's like precision it's like doo -doo 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 -doo, and it's usually under like you know a millisecond or something yeah but humans they like fat finger the button and they do backspaces <laughs> and you know yeah. they're like looking at their phone sideways and like with the flown like a phone is flat and it's just like instantly a password goes in you can start to the kind of dial out obviously um what's a bot and what's yeah. not but stuff like that i had never seen before and that was like right after your class like right when i was going into my grad program i i had been introduced to that and i think that's when we actually started talking again about different ideas and like we were talking about uh, specifically um i'm just kind of going on a security tangent because this stuff's so interesting to me no it is interesting but like they were looking at ways to monitor password usage with like your heart rate because people have different styles of heartbeats and stuff like that. Because even though everyone's heart rate's the same or whatever, like not everyone's heartbeat's the same, but every heart beats, different ones be at different tempos and at different times. And they were trying to figure out a way to link that to passwords. Stuff like that was just things that I felt had kind of rolled off the back of that class yeah. to me. Because up until that point, all the economics classes up at the university was like, Karl Marx this and Karl Marx that. And, you know, it was just like, I'd, well, whatever Karl Marx, but like that class was the first one that actually taught me how to use real world science in the real world. Mm -hmm. And that stuff really tripped me out. 